Thank you for inviting me to deliver the Bradman oration. The respect and the regard that came with the invitation to speak tonight is deeply appreciated. I realize a very distinguished list of gentlemen have preceded me in the 10 years that the Bradman oration has been held. <coughs> I know that this oration is held every year to appreciate the life and career of Sir Don Bradman, a great Australian and a great cricketer. I understand I'm supposed to speak about cricket and issues in the game, and I will. Yet first before all else, I must say I find myself humbled by the venue we find ourselves in. Even though there is neither a pitch in sight, nor stumps, bat and balls, as a cricketer I feel I stand on very sacred ground tonight. When I was told I would be speaking at the National War Memorial, I thought of how often and how meaninglessly the words war, battle, fight are used to describe cricket matches. Yes, we cricketers devote a better part of our adult lives to being prepared to perform for our countries, to persist and compete as intensely as we can, and more. This building, however, recognizes the men and women who lived out the words war, battle, fight, for real, and then gave it all up for their country. Their lives left incomplete, futures extinguished. The people of both our countries <coughs> are often told that cricket is the one thing that brings Indians and Australians together, that cricket is our single common denominator. India's first test series as a free country was played against Australia in November 1947, three months after our independence. Yet the histories of our countries are linked together far more deeply than we think, and further back in time than 1947. We share something else other than cricket. Before they played their first test match against each other, Indians and Australians fought wars together on the same side. In Gallipoli, where along with thousands of Australians, over 1,300 Indians also lost their lives. In World War II, there were Indian and Australian soldiers in El Alamein, North Africa, in Syria-Lebanon campaign, in Burma, in the Battle of Singapore. Before we were competitors, Indians and Australians were comrades. So it is only appropriate that we are here this evening at the Australian War Memorial, where along with celebrating cricket and cricketers, we remember the unknown soldiers of both nations. It is, however, in Congress that I, an Indian, happen to be the first cricketer from outside Australia invited to deliver the Bradman oration. I don't say that because Sir Don once scored 100 before lunch at Lord's, and my 100 this year at Lord's took, uh, well, almost an entire day. <laughs> but, but more seriously, Sir Don played just five tests against India. That was in the first India-Australia series in 1947-48, which was to be his last season at home. He didn't even play in India and remains the most venerated cricketer in India not to have played there. We know that he set foot in India, though, in May 1953, when on his way to England to report on the ashes for an English newspaper, his plane stopped in Kolkata airport. There were said to be close to a thousand people waiting to greet him. As you know, he was a very private person and so got into an army jeep and rushed into a barricaded building annoyed with the airline for having breached confidentiality. That was all Indians of the time saw of Bradman, who remains a mythical figure. For one generation of fans in my country, those who grew up in the 1930s, when India was still under British rule, Bradman represented a cricketing excellence that belonged to somewhere outside England. To a country taking its first steps in test cricket, that meant something. His success against England at that time was thought of as our personal success. He was striking one for all of us ruled by the common enemy, or as your country has so poetically called them, the palms. <laughs> there are two stories that I thought I should bring to your notice. On June 28, 1930, the day Bradman scored 254 at Lords against England was also the day Jawaharlal Nehru was arrested by the police. Nehru was, at the time, one of the most prominent leaders of the Indian independence movement and later independent India's first Prime Minister. The coincidence of the two events was noted by a young boy, K. N. Prabhu, who was both nationalist, cricket fan, and later became independent India's foremost cricket writer. In the 30s, as Nehru went in and out of jail, Bradman went after the England bowling, and for K. N. Prabhu, became a kind of avenging angel. There's another story I've heard about the day in 1933, 
when the news reached India that Bradman's record for the highest test score of 334 had been broken by Wally, Wally Hammond. As much as we love our records, they say some Indian fans at the time were not exactly happy. <laughs> now there's a tale that a few even wanted to wear black bands to mourn the fact that this precious record that belonged to Australia, and by extension us, had gone back to an Englishman. We will never know if this is true, if black bands were ever worn. But as journalists tell me, why let facts get in the way of a good story? <laughs> My own link with Bradman was much like that of most other Indians, through history books, some old video footage, and his wise words. About leaving the game better than you found it, about playing it positively, as Bradman, then a selector, told Richie Benno before the 1960-61 West Indies tour of Australia. Of sending a right message out from cricket to its public. Of players being temporary trustees of a great game. While there may be very little similarity in our records, or our strike rates, or our fielding, I can say this only today in front of all of you. I am actually pleased that I share something very important with Sir Don. He was primarily, like me, a number three batsman. We are the ones who make life easier for the kings of batting, the, the middle order that, that follows us. <laughs> Bradman, Bradman did that with a, with a bit more success and style than, than I did. He dominated bowling attacks and, and put bums on seats. If I bat for any length of time, and I'm warning Cricket Australia, that I'm more likely to bore people to sleep. <laughs> Still, it's nice to have batted for a long time in a position whose benchmark is, in fact, the benchmark for batsmanship itself. Before he retired from public life in his 80s, I do know that Bradman watched Sunil Gavaskar's generation play series in Australia. I remember the excitement that went through Indian cricket when we heard the news that Bradman had seen Sachin Tendulkar bat on TV and thought he batted like him. It was more than mere approval. It was as if the great dawn had passed on his torch. Not to an Aussie or an Englishman or a West Indian, but to one of our own. One of the things Bradman said has stayed in my mind that the finest of athletes had, along with skill, a few more essential qualities to conduct their life with dignity, with integrity, with courage, and modesty. All this, he believed, were totally compatible with pride, ambition, determination, and competitiveness. Maybe those words should be put up in cricket dressing rooms all over the world. As all of you know, Don Bradman passed away on February 25, 2001 two days before the India versus Australia series was to begin in Mumbai. Whenever an important figure in cricket leaves us, cricket's global community pauses in the midst of contests and debates to remember what he represented of us, what he stood for, and Bradman was the pinnacle, the standard against which all test batsmen must take guard. The series that followed two days after Bradman's death later went on to become what many believe was one of the greatest in cricket. It is a series I'd like to believe he would have enjoyed following. A fierce contest between bat and ball went down to the final session of the final day of the final test. Between an Australian team who had risen to their most imposing powers and a young Indian team <coughs> determined to rewrite some chapters of its own history. The 2001 series contained high quality cricket from both sides and had a deep impact on the careers of those who played a part in it. The Australians were near unbeatable in the first half of the new decade, both at home and away. As others floundered against them, India became the only team which competed, which competed with them on even terms. India kept answering questions put to them by the Australians and asking a few themselves. The quality demanded of those contests, sometimes acrimonious, sometimes uplifting, made us, the Indian team, grow and rise. As individuals, we were asked to play to the absolute outer limit of our capabilities, and we often extended them. Now, whenever India and Australia meet, there is an expectation and anticipation. As we get into the next two months of the Border Gavaskar Trophy, players on both sides will want to deliver their best. When we toured in 2007-8, I thought it was going to be my last tour of Australia. The Australians thought it was, the, it was going to be the last time they would be seeing Sachin Tendulkar on their shows. He received warm standing ovations from wonderful crowds all around the country. Well, like a few creaking terminators, we are back. <laughs> Older, wiser, and I hope improved. 
The Australian public will want to stand up to send Sachin off all over, all over again this time. But I must warn you, given how he's been playing these days, there are no guarantees about final goodbyes. In all seriousness, though, the cricket world is going to stop and watch Australia and India. It is Australia's first chance to defend their supremacy at home, following defeat in the 2010 Ashes and a drawn series against New Zealand. It is India's opportunity to prove that the defeat in England in the summer was an aberration that we will bounce back from. If both teams look back on their 2007-8 series in Australia, they will know that they should have done things <coughs> a little differently in the Sydney Test. But I think both sides have moved on from there. We've played each other twice in India already, and relationships between the teams is much better, is, is much better than they have been as far as I can remember. Thanks to the IPL, Indians and Australians have shared dressing rooms. Shane Watson's involvement in Rajasthan, Mike Hussey's role with Chennai, to mention a few, are deeply appreciated back home. And even Shane Warne likes India now. <laughs> I, I, really enjoyed playing, I really enjoyed playing alongside him at Rajasthan last season and can confidently report to you he's not eating imported baked beans anymore. <laughs> Actually, in fact, looking at him the other day, it seems he's not eating anything. It's, it's, it is often said that cricketers, it is often said that, that cricketers are ambassadors for their country. When there's a match to be won, sometimes we think that, there is an un, that it is an unreasonable demand. After all, what would career diplomats do if the result of a test series, say, depended on them walking? But as, but as ties between India and Australia have strengthened, and our contests have become more frequent, we realize that as Indian players, we stand for a vast, varied, of an unfathomable and endlessly fascinating country. At the moment, to much of the outside world, Indian cricket represents only two things, money and power. Yes, that aspect of Indian cricket is a part of the whole, but, is not, but it is not the complete picture. As a player, as a proud and privileged member of the Indian cricket team, I want to say, I want to say that this one-dimensional, often cliched image, relentlessly repeated, is not what Indian cricket is really about. I cannot take all of you into the towns and villages our players come from and introduce you to their families, teachers, coaches, mentors, and teammates who made them international cricketers. I cannot take all of you here to India to show you the belief, struggle, effort, and sacrifice from hundreds of people that runs through our game. As I stand here today, it is important for me to bring Indian cricket and its own remarkable story to you. I believe it is very necessary that cricketing nations try to find out about each other, try to understand each other and the different role cricket plays in different countries, because ours is eventually a very small world. Indian cricket is buzzing, humming, living entity, going through a most remarkable time like no other in our cricketing history. In this last decade, the Indian team represents more than ever before the country we come from, of people from vastly different